Father, we just worship you and give you praise. Praise you, God. Praise you that you know each one of us by name. Praise you, God. Praise you, Lord, that, that you love us with a love that is too deep even for words to express. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Christ Jesus, to die for my sins, for our sins, Lord, that, Lord, that we could have a place in heaven. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We are in Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4 this morning. And we're going to be in verse, starting in verse 23. Some of you talked uh, about Proverbs in Sunday school, and we're going to look at uh, the wisdom. Proverbs is traditionally uh, given credit to King Solomon. Um, he didn't write all the Proverbs, but he did write uh, several of them. And uh, he was known as the wisest man uh, on earth. And so uh, as we look at this, we're going to try to glean something from that wisdom and, and take it into our own lives. Uh, Rome, excuse me, Proverbs chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. Uh, if you need a Bible, there's one in your pew back there. Please feel free to use that. Proverbs chapter 4 and 23. Reading from the English Standard Version this morning. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Lord, I just thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you'd help us to understand it now. Lord, help us to understand the meaning and to apply it to our lives. Father, I ask that you remove any hindrances from our flesh, from our adversary. I ask that, Lord, all those are stilled now and that we can hear your voice speak through your word. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the writer of Proverbs here says, keep your heart with all vigilance. Uh, the New International Version says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is a wellspring of life. I believe the English Standard says, for flow, uh, from it flow the springs of life. Um, and what, what the writer is saying is that, hey, the heart health matters, that, that how your heart is matters, and it affects every part of your life. Now, an interesting thing is in the Hebrew... Uh, if you read this, it would say, above all else, guard your kidneys. Because to the Hebrew, the kidneys were the seat of emotion, and the, uh, it was where uh, thought, uh, you know, love and all those things. Can you imagine Valentine's Day when you're giving a box of kidneys? <laughs> or chocolate-shaped kidneys? Isn't it interesting to study the Bible, Right? I'm glad some of you are wearing masks because I can't see your face right now because I think you may not be smiling. So, but above all else, guard your heart. What it means is guard who you really are on the inside. Guard that. Now, how do we guard that? Well, uh, he, he says that it, it's important here to guard it because uh, in Proverbs over in chapter 23, you don't have to turn there, but he says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. In other words, that, that our, our mental outlook, how we perceive the world, perceive ourselves, affects how we act. Would you say that's true? Yes. The way you perceive yourself is how you act. So if you see yourself as uh, a long distance runner, and uh, someone, are you going to be someone that uh, eats healthy and exercises and does all those things, right? If you see yourself as an official taster for Bluebell, you may look at life a little differently, right? And there's never a spoon big enough. So what he, really what the writer here is telling us when he says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for, for, uh, from it flow the springs of life, keep your heart with vigilance. In other words, be careful what enters into your mind and into your heart because it can change your outlook and it can ultimately change you. Be careful what you allow into your mind and into your heart. 
Faith comes from the heart. And faith, like anything, needs to be exercised, right? Muscles need to be exercised to, to grow strength. And then you get something called muscle memory, right? Now, any of you that have done uh, athletic, anybody that's played golf or uh, tennis, we've got some tennis players, football, right? When, when you play uh, tennis or uh, how many times do you practice, uh, some, some of you that have played tennis, how many times did you practice just the serve, just over and over before you could get it right? Anyone? Bueller? They don't. They haven't got it right yet. <laughs> oh, you must be playing with, with, your, with John. Um, so how many times now? I know uh, Holden, you, you are a quarterback. You throw the football, right? Do you just throw it once or twice and then you're done? I'm good for the day. That's it, right? Do you have, do you have one of those tires or those target things and you throw it? You know, in the pros... Those guys may spend hours just tossing it right through. Now, in the pros, you don't have to go pick the ball up yourself. That's the difference, right? Uh, but, but if they're in the pros, why do they keep doing that? Why do they keep going and, and practicing? Why do pianists, world, world, well, perfect practice makes perfect. World-round pianists spend hours a day, classical pianists, playing the piano. Don't you think they already know how to play the piano? Why do they do that? Because they've got to strengthen that ability, they've got to have muscle memory, and, and they, they know that's going to affect their performance. You see, the same is true for us as believers. We have to guard our hearts, we have to realize, okay, God, who am I? Well, I'm who you say I am. And, I, and I've got to believe that, I've got to study that, and I've got to focus on that daily. There's an old saying, if you don't spend time uh, reading the Bible uh, and praying to the Lord, uh, the first day, God knows it. If you don't spend time reading your Bible and praying to the Lord, the second day, you know it. And by the third day, everybody knows it, right? Because if you don't get filled up, guess what happens? We live in a place where nature abhors a vacuum, and if nothing is good is being put in, something bad will be pulled in, right? And we tend to think uh, in because we live in a fallen world, when things aren't going well or when something unexpected happens, it immediately we think, well, that must be bad. Well, oh no, what, what's that? Why are they running late? Or why couldn't they be here? I wonder what's going on. Why didn't my grandmother send me a card this year with a check for my birthday? I wonder if she's mad. Maybe it's a crummy post office, right? Because grandma loves me. Doesn't your grandma love you? Some of you aren't so sure. Oh my gosh, you guys are going to have to work with me now. This is going to be a long, boring sermon if you don't work with me, right? All right, so I can just keep preaching and preaching until you're happy. <laughs> right? It's like that sign at work, the beatings will continue till morale improves. All right, so... The writer of Proverbs here is saying, hey, guard your heart, watch what is, check your heart health. That's, that's good advice physically, right? You're supposed to go to the doctor every year and have a physical, and they check your heart, check your blood pressure, all those kind of things. Uh, and how do we check our heart health? Well, the inside gets revealed by the tongue. Now, that's a strange thing. You know, when the doctor looks in your mouth, they can see a lot of things, right? Uh, Gail uh, is a dentist and working on her last year in dental school. And I, what I thought is interesting is the eye doctor and the dentist can look at your teeth and your eyes and they can know other things about your body. And so we'll get that fixed. Don't worry. Y'all see that light that went off and on? Or is that just me? You had your chance. Yeah, some of you just said it was you. But, but here's the thing. The tongue, the mouth, can be an indicator of something else that's wrong on the inside, right? And what the writer of Proverbs here is saying is that, that keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away your crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. So what he's saying is that... The inside is revealed. Who we really are is revealed by our tongue. 
Now, I'm going to struggle with this. I have to tell you, sometimes my, uh, my mouth can overload the rest of me. Anybody else relate? Amen. Right? It's difficult for me because sometimes I don't even know what I think till I've said it. <laughs> right? Anybody else relate? Peter is that in the, in the New Testament, right? I just identify with Peter because Peter can just, he can do great and then he can just mess right up. But but the inside reveals, Proverbs 10 says this, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Jeremiah said it this way, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, did you catch that? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? In other words, most of us have a problem on the inside and you hear people say, well, just follow your heart. Well, if you follow your heart, where's that going to lead you? Just inside your chest, right? Do we just always go by emotion? Do we just follow our heart? Of course not. Jeremiah says that we can't even trust our heart. Your heart can fool yourself. You ever believe something that wasn't true and you, you had taught yourself to not believe it was true, right? Like, oh, I don't need to get my car inspected. They'll never notice, right? I'm really trying to identify with you people, and you guys are not going to commit, you know, confess your sins. This is going to be a long sermon. Or 10 miles an hour over, who's going to even care, right? Or if you're in my family, 20, 30 miles an hour over, who's going to care? Well, your dad will for one, right? But here's the thing. The inside is revealed, the heart condition is revealed by our tongue. Jesus said it this way, that he said that it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but it's what comes out. Amen? Amen. And, and here's the thing. We need to understand that if we don't understand who we are and who God is, then we can't do a heart check. If we, only, if we let the world influence us and we don't realize who, who God is and who I am in his creation and in his calling... If, if you don't understand that God values you, that you're a child of God, if you've accepted Christ as Savior, that He has written your name. The Bible says He's inscribed His name on the palms of our hands. So He'll, he'll never forget. Isn't that amazing? James Poston would say, well, that's the original Palm Pilot. <laughs> right? And some of the kids are like, what's a Palm Pilot? Yeah. It's, it's kind of like a phone, but never mind. Now, the inside, if we can't trust it, how do we know? Well, we have to know someone we can trust. You have to know the Lord because he's always right and he's always true. Amen? God tells you the things that you don't even want to hear. Doesn't he? And that's a true friend or someone who really loves you. You may not want to hear it, but if they speak it to you in love and you know that they love you, you can trust them. Amen? Well, God knows. Now, here's the thing. We have to know who we're dealing with. We have to know that our heart can be wicked, that we can deceive ourselves, and we have to lean to the wisdom of the Lord. I was uh, reading one time, and a lady, she was working for a company, and she was the HR person who would instruct them on proper dress etiquette. This was a, a formal firm, and in New York City, and, and so, you know, everybody had to wear a coat and tie, or the ladies had to dress appropriately, and she got on the elevator, and she had just taught the class, and she got on the elevator, and here's a guy wearing, a, you know, a, a golf shirt and slacks. And as the door closes, she looks over at him, and she says, huh, dressed a little casual today, aren't we? And they got to the next floor, and the door opened, and he walked out, and he said, well, yeah, and he turned, and he said, but, you know, I guess that's the benefit of owning the company. She probably shouldn't have said anything, huh? If she had known who he was, she wouldn't have, right? If you know who the Lord is and who you are, then you can trust him. But you have to know his opinion is what counts, not what I think of myself, not even what my mom thinks of me or my spouse or my, my friends. What counts is what does God think of me and what does he, what does he communicate to me? So... When it says that above all else, guard your heart, it's the wellspring of life and put away uh, 
Put away foul speech from your mouth, corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. He, he's saying that, that what, when we speak, when we speak, what's in us comes out. And sometimes it's not very good, is it? Now, I'm not going to preach to anybody else but myself. Sometimes the old Don stuff comes out and I'm like, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that that came out. Sometimes, do you know, sometimes I can offend people and I'm not even trying. That's never happened to any of y'all, I'm sure. And if I've used your name in an illustration or a story without permission, get over it. No, I'm sorry, right? <laughs> really, the only people I do that to is my own kids and wife. So, although that's been greatly curtailed, greatly curtailed. <laughs> So, when he says to guard our hearts, we need to make sure our heart is right. Now, if Jeremiah is right, though, if the heart is, is desperately wicked, if it's, if it's uh, deceitful above all things, desperately sick, uh, and, and who can understand it, what, how do we fix it? How do we fix our heart? Well, we need a heart transplant. Just if you have a, an unhealthy or a sick heart, we need our hearts changed. And the way that that is done uh, is by trusting Christ as Savior. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says this, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So how does a person become a, a believer, a follower of Christ? Well, they confess that Jesus is Lord. They say, God, here's my life. You can have it. You can be the boss. I, it's a mess, but if you, if, Lord, if you'll have me, you can have it. There's, there's no formulatic prayer that you have to pray to be a Christian, right? It's really just a surrender. God, my life's a mess, and, and I, I can't do it. You, when you realize your heart's wicked, and you can't fix yourself, just like a person that needs a heart transplant, can they give their own? Do, do they do heart surgery on themselves? Even if you're the best doctor in the world, would you do your own heart surgery? You'd be, you'd be crazy, right? You just want to find at least the second best doctor to do it, but he'd be better than or she'd be better than you, right? So we need a heart transplant. When, when we confess our sins and say, God, I agree with you, that I, I need you to save me, that's, that's calling on the name of the Lord. And believe that, what did it say? That God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That Jesus who was put on a cross, that physically died, was put in a tomb three days later, physically bodily rose again to life. That, that we trust in what he did on the cross to pay the penalty for, for my sins, for your sins. So the tongue is important because if we confess and we call upon, the Bible says that, that he takes away our sin or that he removes it as far as the east is from the west. One of the pictures I like is he throws it into the depths of the sea and remembers it no more. He forgives us and then he makes us. But not only does God forgive, but he makes us right on the inside. He fixes what I can't. And he changes. He changes our speech. But the speech is just a picture of what's going on on the inside. So how do you guard your heart? Well, first you need to make sure you've confessed Christ as Savior and Lord. And then secondly, you need to refill your heart or renew your mind. And you do that by kind of what you're doing now. You come to church, you worship together, you read the scripture, you sing to the Lord, you talk to the Lord. Uh, here's, here's what it says in Matthew 16. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day raised. Now, here's what's happened. Jesus has just revealed to his disciples that he is the Messiah. He's the way to heaven. He's the only way to get there. And Peter says, he, Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Messiah. And Jesus says to him, and on this rock I will build my church. On that confession, Peter, you got it. A plus, right? And then Jesus says, but I have to go to the cross. I, you just got to love Peter because, man, he's head of the class. And he didn't quit while he was ahead. Because the very next, I mean, the next sentence down, and from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. 
And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. He went from pinnacle to pit like that, right? Now, Peter's just an extreme example. But here's the thing. If our mind isn't right, if we don't realize who God is and that he has a plan and that we have a role to play in it, if we just try to play God, try to figure out God's plan and somehow make it work on this life or on this earth, we'll never get it right. Peter didn't want Jesus to die. He wanted him to assume a throne and become a king and kick out the Romans and, and, I mean, on and on, right? And Peter was genuine. He was just genuinely wrong. So we have to make sure that we're lined up with God's plan. Well, how do you do that? Well, you, you read the Word. You read the Scripture. You study it. You, you talk to the Lord about it. D.L. Moody said that that. The Bible is the only book that when I read it, it reads me. When I read it, it reads it. God can convict, right? And, and he can point out areas in your life. So we need to spend time in God's word. We need accountability with, with other believers to say, hey, that's not what God's, you can do better. God's created you for something better. We need, accountability. we need to be with other believers in a Sunday school class or in worship together, uh, maybe one-on-one -on -one discipleship, but we need each other. If we want to understand who we are and who God is, then just like that memory muscle, that all that work, it takes some work. We have to do our part, but God begins to change our thinking so our thinking lines up with him and not with what the world says. Not with what, because, you know, sometimes we're wrong and we don't even know it. I, I can remember a missionary talking about how in Africa that they, they preached and they, they when they had uh, offering time, um, people would give what they had. Now they're under a tree and they're just worshiping and, and worship would go on for hours, kind of like it feels like this sermon is right now. And, and it would just go on and on, right? And he said, but during the offertory, people would get so excited. They would, they would give what they had to learn. And he said, they were poor. He said, they would give chickens and they would give eggs or they would give some, some food or something. You know, they would give a goat. And I thought, how in the world do you get a goat in the offering plate? I mean, David made some great offering boxes in the back for people to give if you didn't get a chance to, we're not passing the plate. because But you couldn't get a goat. It's not big enough for that, Dave, Right? But then it hit me, why am I thinking about... See, I'm thinking they have to worship like we do. But does God care about the style of worship or does God care about the heart of worship? It's the fact that they would come up to the altar. They would walk up and lay whatever their offering was on the altar and give it to the Lord. And they were excited to do it, even though they didn't have much. Do you get that excited about offering? Or is that kind of like halftime at church? When we're passing the plates, you know? They, they got excited. Why? Well, you know why? Because their hearts were right. And they realized what they were doing was worshiping. And it's what they were created for. And not to put too fine a point on it, you were created to worship God. Your tongue was created to praise Him. Your tongue was, was created to edify other people and lead them and draw them to the Lord. And here's the problem when my heart's not right with God. When my heart's not right with Him, and things come out of my heart that aren't from him, it pushes people away from God and doesn't draw them to him. Family members, friends, loved ones. And God created you to draw people to God so they could know what it means to be forgiven and whole and have everything right. Does that mean that Peter's sinless? No, he blew it, right? The heart of Christ, the Messiah. Oh, yay, Peter. And then what? Next step, boom. Still human. But Peter knew Jesus as his Savior. And Jesus redeemed him. And he goes on to be the leader of the church. He, he preaches a bold sermon right in the middle of the temple. This man who was, who was 
not having his mind on the things of God, who denied Jesus three times. God did something in him. What did he do? He said, Peter, you're not right. Confess it, get right with me, and I'll make you right on the inside. I'll make your heart strong. And it will affect everything else. So my question for you this morning is this. How's your heart? Is it strong? Is it spiritually strong before the Lord? What does he say about it? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for what the Proverbs says, Lord. I thank you that, God, that, that wisdom is, is knowing you. And that guarding our hearts, Lord, means just checking every day. Lord, what do you think about it? Am I on the right track? It's not complicated, Lord, but it, it's steady. I, I ask God for these here this morning. If they don't know you as Savior, if they haven't trusted you, that first step of just confessing Jesus as Lord, just letting you be the boss of their life. I pray, God, that you touch their heart and allow them to, whatever holds them back, to let go of that and just come to you just like they are with everything that's wrong in their life, God. I thank you, God, that in spite of all their yuck, you know it and you love them in spite of it. And I thank you, God, that you love us so much you don't leave us in our yuck. God, for those who are believers who, God, we've stumbled like Peter and we're, we're not thinking the things of God. We're not using our tongue to glorify God, but we've, we've, Lord, we've dishonored you or we've torn down others or we've done what we shouldn't. Father, I, I just ask, God, that you would change our hearts, renew our hearts, fill us up, oh God. Fill us up with your love that we can splash it onto others. We just freely confess, God, we can't do it on our own. But thank you, God, that we can with you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.